Disclaimer. These videos are meant to be a brief overview of the subject. They are written to meet time constraints while still conveying factual historical information. My sources for each video are in the video summary below and can get you started on a more in-depth look at the subject. On a personal note, if there is a way to mispronounce the name, I will do it. It is a gift and I am sorry about it ahead of time. Welcome to Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition. Today we're going to talk about the first battle Charleston Harbor, located in Charleston County, South Carolina, on April 7th, 1863. A bright spot of defense for the Confederacy in early 1863 was the fortified city of Charleston Harbor. The Confederates had spent months creating earthen fortifications topped by additional masonry fortifications. They had arranged for more than 75 heavy cannons around the harbor, mined the harbor itself, and sank many obstructions in the ship channel to slow any Union attack. In addition to all this, the Confederate Navy has stationed three Confederate ironclads along with many torpedo boats in the harbor. The Union command had been planning an invasion of Charleston for months. Aware of the still unbroken Confederate military, they wished to secure the same harbor that contained Fort Sumter. This would have the side effect of shutting down Confederate defenses. It would also allow the Union to invade the Carolinas, a place once thought untouchable by the Confederate citizenry. In charge of this attack was Union Major General David Hunter, along with 10,000 soldiers. He was tasked to work with U.S. Navy Rear Admiral Samuel F. DuPont. DuPont and his South Atlantic blockading squadron, consisting of seven monitors and two ironclads, the Keokok, and New Ironsides was responsible for Hunter's transport and combat support. Admiral DuPont had for months expressed his overwhelming fear of Confederate torpedoes and mines. Union command had taken him seriously, though, and it called upon John Erickson, the designer of the new Monitor-class warship, to design some sort of defense against torpedoes and mines. He did this by creating the first minesweepers used. Minesweepers were designed to originally have a raft-like structure of heavy wooden logs attached to the front of each ship. The raft would have a grappling hook whose intention was to snag the mooring lines of torpedoes. It would also carry its own torpedo to blast its way through any obstruction. None of the Union Navy captains at this time were willing to mount these rafts on their ships. This included Admiral DuPont himself. This was in fear of accidentally having a collision with another ship in a tight channel and detonating the torpedo on a friendly ship. Admiral DuPont was focused on attacking Fort Sumter and then moving south to Morris Island. DuPont ordered his attack on April 7th and almost immediately his plan had problems. He came across a heavy current and far more mined obstructions than he had anticipated. This slowed him down and made him easy pickings for the guns on Fort Sumter and Fort Moultrie. The poor attack plan resulted in each of the U.S. Navy ships being hit by dozens of cannon shots. The most obvious of this was the Keokuk, who sat off Fort Sumter and bombarded Fort Sumter for 30 minutes, but eventually was forced to retreat because she had taken more than 90 shots. The Keokuk sank the next day from damage it sustained with no loss of life. DuPont had ordered a retreat as nightfall arrived. Unhappy about his performance and unhappy that General Hunter and his men were unable to secure any of the Confederate targets on land, he sent a report back to command indicating he was attacking again the next day. What he didn't expect was that every single one of his captains of his ships refused his order and opposed the idea of another assault at this time. Evidently, Union Command felt the same way as both DuPont and Hunter were fired. DuPont was replaced by U.S. Navy Rear Admiral John A. Dalgreen, while Hunter's replacement was U.S. Brigadier General Quincy A. Gilmore. Total casualties was light for both sides, with the Union suffering 22 and the Confederacy only 14 casualties. Join us again next time on Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition.